Greetings, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Heather Decker-Davis, as we mentioned, and this is More Than Software in Theory, a sort of tips and tricks session for educators involved with game-specific programs. So firstly, a bit about myself. I write for Alt Dev Blog A Day. I'm the secretary of IGDA Chicago Chapter Board of Directors. I was one of the inaugural IGDA E3 scholars last year. I'm currently an adjunct instructor at Clinton Community College, as well as a final year MFA student at Savannah College of Art and Design. Naturally, this isn't my complete life story, but I think it'll do for our purposes here. Outside of this session, feel free to email me or interact with me on Twitter. In short, I get pretty excited about education, particularly game development specific education, which is something I've been pretty well acquainted with over the past six years. This session is about striving to bridge the gap between the academic experience and the real world. My mission is to offer some reasonable tips and suggestions, some tidbits educators may consider, because we all have the same mission, arming students with everything they need to be successful in game development. Now, I understand that teaching is tough and resources are often limited. You can go in with a solid plan of action and sometimes things don't exactly work out as you'd intended. It happens. Optimally, I'd like this session to plant the seed. So whenever you do have an opportunity, you can try to go that extra mile. By striving to be the best possible instructors we can, we'll help students grow to be the best they can be. Talented, thoughtful instructors are key to guiding the next generation of game developers on the right path. You can make a tremendous impact as an instructor. Regarding the following tips, if, you're already, if you've already thought of these things, or even just some of them, that's awesome. Please keep it up. But for good measure, I'd like to cover some areas of consideration when it comes to training students for entry into game development. So an overall stumbling block we run into is that game development as a major of study has only recently been a reality. It's still fairly young. At this point, educators are still getting the hang of it. So we don't have a long lineage of time-honored practices to look to and model our curriculum after. At least not yet. Fortunately, most institutions have the basics down. Students need to know the tools, such as the software they'll be expected to work in and the syntax they'll communicate in. For example, we know we want artists to be proficient in at least one 3D modeling package, and we'd like programmers to be fluent in at least a couple of major languages. Additionally, no matter which area of specialization we're talking about, students also need a strong background in theory to know how to critically think about their craft and develop an iterative process grounded in core foundations of their discipline. For instance, we can generally all agree that game designers should be familiar with concepts like player agency and emergent systems. That sort of thing just makes sense. Now, no one can really argue against teaching the tools and principles of a specific discipline, but there's a bit more we can weave into game development education, some less obvious areas of importance, which are often overlooked. Software and theory are the necessary foundation we can build upon. So firstly, students are attracted to game development because it's their passion, but that very same passion can end up at odds with their success in a commercial team-based field. Students can become enthralled by a particular idea, sometimes to the point that it blinds them to any other possibilities. As educators, we want to encourage the positive facets of passion, things like motivation and creativity, while also helping our students to get a handle on those negative bits that come in tow. It's not uncommon for new students to get so excited and attached to their work that they subconsciously identify it as an extension of themselves. We need to help them become aware of this because it can negatively impact their work, not to mention their morale. Critiques are suddenly personal attacks when the student is unable to view their work as a separate entity from their self. Another rampant issue with passionate students is that they're prone to falling in love with a particular idea, um, according to their personal tastes, rather than any deeper logic or reasoning. There are always multiple solutions to any given problem, and it pays to consider more than one path to solving something. On the art end of things, we demand that students make thumbnails before they crank out a, fi a finished piece, because it's a visual form of brainstorming and searching for the best answer among many. The first thought that comes to mind is not always the most fitting solution. More often than not, a student's favorite idea isn't always the best choice either. We must encourage our students to evaluate their ideas based on the underlying goals rather than just personal taste. It's great when the two can overlap, 
it's just not always something that's possible. No matter which discipline your program hones in on, encouraging healthy attitudes towards work is extremely useful. Encourage students to actively seek feedback as early as possible. Learn how to effectively filter this feedback themselves and, of course, leverage this information to create the best possible end products. Even intro-level courses can benefit from peer feedback and critiques. It's a training ground for giving and receiving constructive criticism. Get them used to hearing both good and bad things about their work, because feedback is intimately bound to commercial work. It's not going away anytime soon. Your employer is going to have plenty of things to say about your work. In fact, in a commercial field, the client or publisher always has thoughts about the work that's being done because they're paying the bills. No matter how great an idea is, students are going to need to effectively communicate that to somebody higher up the food chain if they want to ever see it become a reality. Often an idea goes through many revisions according to feedback before it's actually deemed acceptable. Another practice we could shake we should seek to instill is the art of personal reflection. Not just doing something and having it over with, but actually reflecting on what went right, what went wrong, and what should probably be approached different next time. A postmortem of a project compiles this experience into a, a sort of diary for personal growth. If we get students accustomed to critically evaluating their experiences in this fashion, they'll be poised to get the most out of their projects. It's never too early to start getting them used to talking or writing about their experiences in the interest of professional growth. Above and beyond one-time retrospectives, things like design journals, process books, etc., are excellent tools. And last but not least, this is a closely knit industry, as well as quite a small world. Therefore, it's in a student's best interest to be honest when communicating with professionals and potential employers. Lying or exaggerating will only catch up to them. Encourage your students to be genuine. In addition to our major goal of training awesome students, this also fulfills a side quest of maintaining your institution's reputation. Game development is also one of those fields that requires a great deal of communication, since you're working with so many other people all the time. Communication comes more naturally to some than others, but as a general rule of thumb, practice makes perfect. Students should be developing pitches and proposals throughout their coursework, discovering how to successfully market their ideas to others. Furthermore, they need to be familiar with authoring plans, both for their own records as well as for other team members to reference as they work towards the same goal. Getting it all out on paper helps them log important details and sort through what could otherwise be a jumbled idea cloud in their head. The ideal form planning materials should take is always kind of arguable, but common incarnations include design logs and design documents. Another detail that students don't often get to practice with is internal documentation for things like tools. Making manuals and wikis is just a great practice in this field. Wikis are of particular interest because they're not just a solid concrete document that's created and it's over with. Wikis are living, breathing things that can be continually updated. They're very handy for our terms with uh, student projects and so forth. Overall, communication is a critical component in working well with others. Solid teamwork hinges on effective communication between many individuals who make up the team. So unless your students will all be exiting school and going solo, creating static sound clips or programming text-based adventures in a basement somewhere, they need experience working with people in other disciplines and putting it all together. Most games today are developed by anywhere from 2 to 200 people, sometimes even more, sometimes thousands of people. And they're all bringing art, design, sound, storytelling, marketing, programming, production, tools, business, etc., all under the umbrella of a single goal. Teaching game development as an isolated, single discipline experience is sort of like giving a bunch of construction apprentices a, each a plan for a single element, like a window or the plumbing, but never actually offering them the chance to build a house. Sure, they'll, they'll grasp some of the basic building blocks that make up the end product, but they aren't going to be familiar with how it actually comes together. That, that part in the, in the middle, the process, it's missing. They certainly won't go out into the world with any experience building something from a blueprint to completion, and that's a huge problem. Uh, employers are really, really interested in students that can actually create a game and have experience creating a game. 
So student teams are an opportunity for us to simulate the collaborative environment of the studio. Generally, the production stage is where all of the tough problems arise. We don't see a lot of insurmountable showstoppers in the idea phase of a project. In order to develop the necessary mindset of resourcefulness in the face of challenges and encourage active problem solving, we need to set the stage for real world learning experiences. Students are forced to respond to unique issues, prioritize their tasks, and will probably face some situations in which they need to make careful, tough decisions about what to cut in order to stay on track. As educators, we should strive to offer abundant opportunities for collaboration, but it's not something you can do on day one of a program. Teamwork is actually more successful when each individual possesses the knowledge to effectively contribute. My personal recommendation would be to start with solo classes on the software and theory we talked about earlier, then offer group projects as a next step when students have the basic knowledge and know-how they need to actually complete tasks. There are certain programs that have great collaboration in place already, and I commend them, but I feel that there's even more that actually leave out this critical component. Teamwork is absolutely crucial. Give your students an arena in which they can practice working together and solving unique problems that arise, and they'll be better armed to collaborate in the field. Research is another one of those good habits you should get your students into as early as possible. They should actively want to seek more information all the time. Research is the opening stage of any commercial game project. For any idea, it's important to identify what's already out there along the same lines. This also has a very practical purpose in the commercial world, as you don't want to sink time and money into something that's already been done a million times over. For students, it's also a great learning opportunity. They can observe how developers execute specific types of games and analyze why they might have made certain types of decisions. For additional real-world application, you can even try having your students go into research markets and demographics. It's always a good consideration. Typically, games call for additional research above and beyond the market variety. For example, students interested in making a period-specific game will need to gather information about the time period they have in mind. So every, every, There's just a ton of different simple situations in which research is helpful. How things work, um, different ways of envisioning different things about different types of games. Since games are such a broad and sweeping area in which we can explore and do so many different things and try so many different ideas out, Research is really just a great starting point for any project. Overall, research is just a huge part of the field in general, and getting proficient at it early on is useful. Game development is a technology-based field, and it's always changing. No one is ever going to be done learning. Encourage your students to embrace lifelong learning. Active curiosity is great. Get them, get them curious and incorporate research into your assignments to encourage this. Now, by extra credit, I'm not actually referring to literal extra credit in your class, but additional activities that will increase your students' chances of actually breaking into the industry. This is a very, very competitive field, and just scraping by with the bare minimum effort is not going to cut it. Your students will be competing not only with other students, but also with other veteran game developers who have even more experience. Try to get your students involved with professional organizations sooner rather than later. Some programs actually require students to join relative professional organizations, such as the International Game Developers Association, or IGDA, which is brilliant. You see, generally the value of professional organizations isn't immediately apparent to a lot of students. Some even have the misconception that the organization is going to place them in a job. And while they won't be getting a job handed to them, um, attending events and gatherings and meetings out there, becoming a memorable face to employers, talking to people in the field, and learning real world things, making new contacts, these are all things that are going to help them get a job, it just won't be as, as directly as they may have liked. It's definitely beneficial overall. Have them build a habit of involvement and participation early on if you can. Encourage volunteerism. This particular point also has a bonus in that it nurtures our game development community by instilling positive values in our up-and-coming developers. And students don't just have to volunteer for professional organizations. Helping out other developers can be fun and rewarding in its own right, whether they need some casual testing or some help at an event. Speaking from personal experience, I had an amazing time helping with an IGF booth last year. 
I met tons of awesome people and learned the logistics of running a booth. Volunteering is just overall awesome, and I'd love to see it encouraged more. Above and beyond normal studies, also be able, um, also be sure to point out external opportunities like scholarships. IGDA actually has a fantastic scholarship, several fantastic scholarships that get students into events like E3, GDC, South by Southwest, um, gets them some mentorship while they're there, studio tours, and just tons of awesome stuff. It's definitely something that all instructors should be pointing out to their students. Additionally, getting into competitions and festivals is also highly useful to students, but it isn't often something that's worked into the classes. When students want to enter something like the Independent Games Festival, they have a hard deadline to face. They get the experience of producing a game, they have a, port a new portfolio piece from it, and they get potential exposure from being in the competition. There's just tons of benefits, and it could take an entire another presentation to communicate them all. In, in short, entering festivals and so forth and competitions is just really productive for students. And lastly, on a related note actually, the Global Game Jam is another great opportunity to mention to your students. It's an annual IGDA event in which participants from all around the world create games in a single 48-hour window of time. For students, it's just an amazing lesson, a crash course, if you will, in rapid prototyping and prioritization. You, you definitely can't hesitate or switch gears very often on a 48-hour game jam. And social media is also something we should be talking about a little bit with our students. All social media can technically be used intelligently for professional growth, but I'm only actually going to cover one particular network in detail today, Twitter, which I personally feel is the most frequently used by developers. Many people use Twitter very casually, but shockingly, there's more to it than telling the world what you had for lunch. Students can follow useful news accounts like Gama Sutra to stay on top of breaking industry news. They can connect with amazing developers who may still tweet about their lunch, photograph their shoes, or express their stance on wearing pants, but who will also tweet nuggets of game development wisdom, share useful articles and videos, spread valuable job listings around, and share useful um, info about events. Even if your students can't even make it to these events, being in the loop is extremely useful. For example, during GDC, a lot of the developers actually tweet brilliant quotes from the sessions they're attending. So there's a lot of value in that. Your, your students could get free nuggets of GDC just by, fe by following developers who are at GDC. Now, of course, in, in the topic of social media, we always have to talk a little bit about proper online courtesy. Um, this is another one of those topics that could take up a whole session on its own. But just be sure to remind your students to be polite be, be very polite in their interactions on social networks. Be, be thoughtful about this. Um, spamming their heroes is just generally a bad move. They should definitely strive to be respectful. Now, an interesting case study on the usefulness of Twitter lies in the tale of the IMS211 hashtag. Last year, an instructor at Miami University set out to prove the usefulness of Twitter to his students with one simple tweet which was retweeted beyond his wildest dreams, generating about 3,000 tweets within two days, and, and it continued to carry on after that. And I just frankly lost track of, of the sheer amount of tweets that were generated by this. Um, in short, clearly there are game developers out there, and clearly they are using Twitter. It's a very helpful resource. Also related on networking. Networking is huge, but not all programs actually stress its importance enough. Please do. Talk, talk about networking all day long sometime. It's, it's a good thing. The more people your students network with, the better chance they have to be connected with an opportunity that suits them. For example, you may have a student who's an excellent game composer, but no one is going to bang down his or her door for game music. If they actually get out there in the world and start meeting other people in the field, they're more likely encounter to encounter folks who actually need a composer for the project, people who actually need their skills. The more people you know, the more potential connections happen. As an added bonus, networking is also a great exercise in those communication skills I was talking about earlier. When discussing networking, a great tool to mention is LinkedIn, which could be considered sort of like the professional variant of Facebook. 
Students can connect with people they meet while networking on LinkedIn, forging stronger social bonds than just a stack of business cards alone would get them. Again, as a friendly reminder, it's also good to encourage students to keep their LinkedIn profiles professional. Give them tips, like including a nice picture, uh, a nice professional picture, not one of them uh, slamming a beer or something. Uh, have them use proper grammar on their profile. Uh, people who they've never met will also be stumbling upon this profile, so first impressions are highly important. Speaking of which, a lot of professionalism is actually centered around first impressions. People who don't know your students will inevitably infer things about them based on their appearance and how they conduct themselves. In a professional environment, this can mean the difference between a job and their resume in the garbage. Some students don't actually think very deeply into this matter, unfortunately, so it never hurts to point it out. Portfolio classes tend to be good platforms to really delve deeper into this topic, but it's something you can sprinkle throughout any amount of coursework. Additionally, talk to students about marketing themselves to potential employers. They should identify their strengths and communicate them. How will someone who doesn't know them and doesn't know what they're good at, uh, who doesn't know them know what they're good at, for that, that matter, <laughs> unless they actually speak up about it? So urge them to put their best foot forward in all of their professional interactions. And, of course, whenever professionalism and networking come up, there's one resource I cannot stop myself from sharing. It just it happens all the time. Uh, Darius Kazemi's blog contains an excellent section called Effective Networking in the Game Industry. I highly recommend this to like everyone in the world. Um, share this with your game development students. Please, please do. Uh, we'll share the uh, web address to this afterwards. Now, of course, networking, or I'm sorry, professionalism is another one of those topics that could warrant an entire presentation to itself. Just remember to, to work a lot with your students on professionalism. In short, it's not enough to simply mill through a list of the top software programs, programming languages, and theories. It's certainly a good start, and we definitely need this basic foundation, but we should be actively seeking to instill additional skills and values in our pupils, which is key in a collaborative field like this. We must prepare future developers for team-based commercial development environments by encouraging positive attitudes and practices, offering opportunities to develop problem-solving skills, building communication skills, offering opportunities for teamwork, pointing out the benefits of volunteerism and extracurricular activities, and promoting networking and professionalism. In short, seek to inspire your students. The more we can do to guide them on the right path, the better we can shape our industry's positive growth and sense of community. It's all good stuff. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. Um, so are there any questions anybody has? Uh, there's 27 of you, so I imagine somebody somewhere has a question. There are no stupid questions. That's a lie. There are. Um, but ask it anyway. <laughs> Even comments, uh, feedback, say hello. <laughs> Paul Evans says hello. Thank you, Paul. Hi, Paul. <laughs> um, so uh, you mentioned briefly uh, the scholarship program. Um, so I guess an obvious question where we can uh, fill some time is, can you talk a little bit more about the scholarship program? Well, certainly. Um, I know they receive a great deal of applications every year, but basically the, the idea is to look around the world and pick the best and brightest students that they can find, and they hook them up with these great scholarships. They, they usually refer to it as like uh, an, an Oprah treatment, basically, because they, they do. They whisk you around, and you get to meet developers in person and talk to so many different people, go to so many neat places. Um, I know Luke and I were E3 scholars. They, they took us to um, EA, and we met with so many different people, just so many different things. We, we got the insider tour around E3 and everything. It's just uh, quite, quite an amazing experience. And I'd like to see more schools actually you know, mentioning this to students. I keep encountering people who don't even know it exists, unfortunately. And it's just a terrible shame. Now, 
Paul is asking if I think that studios offer enough internships. That is a very interesting question, Paul. Um, actually, it doesn't, the internships are also severely competitive out there. Um, I'm not sure where exactly to, you know, point a finger at over that, but studios don't offer a great deal of internships, so uh, it's often hard for students to hook up with them. I'm sure there's probably more deep and complicated reasons as to why this is, but it's the unfortunate reality of, of the matter. Um, a lot of students are all competing for the same internship at the same time, which is why, you know, things that I talked about in this session are highly important. Um, any way that students can set themselves apart will help them stand out and actually obtain these highly competitive internships. And I have a question from Matthew. Ah, students, uh, how would I suggest that students ask for feedback when it's not readily provided necessarily? That, that's a great question. Um, it never hurts to ask, actually. I mean, some instructors um, handle it different ways, but I mean, I feel, I feel as, as instructors we should be open to responding to students when they, when they do want more feedback. Try our best to actually be detailed about it and, and tell them some really useful things, like whether it's good or bad, all of it, all of it can be useful to the student. Um, don't, don't go with these answers of just like copping out like, oh, well, you did fine. It, that, that's not exactly good feedback. You need to be a little more detailed about what works and what doesn't and maybe what the student could be considering to push it farther next time. And it looks like we have more questions. Uh, has the scholarship affected my career? Um, I think absolutely. Um, if it weren't for the scholarship, uh, basically, I wouldn't be here right now uh, contributing to the Alt Dev Conf. Um, Luke and I actually met through the scholarship, and uh, Luke asked me if I'd like to get involved uh, co-chairing on the education track, and I said yes. And pretty soon here, I was chairing the thing, and and here we all are today. So I think it has greatly expanded the opportunities that I was able to meet up with as a result. And would I suggest students take a gap year from Paul? Um, I, it depends on the students, really. Uh, basically, if, if, their life, uh, if their life jumps out and uh, presents them with a situation in which they, they really should, then you, know, you can't do much about that. Um, life happens sometimes. You should take a gap if you absolutely need to. Otherwise, um, a lot of students just want to get it done and over with as, as soon as possible. And, um, I'm I'm from that camp. Let's let's get through this kind of thing. Uh, so I don't personally uh, enjoy the gap, but that's just me. <laughs> and uh, someone here is uh, toying with the idea of having high school tutorials for interested students. Uh, is there anything I might recommend as a good inspirational project? Um, right off the top of my head. I don't have one lined up, but for high school students, um, it's often handy to get them involved with uh, tools that are easier to use. Like, I use uh, Game Maker with my students right now because they can get by without necessarily knowing how to script. Um, they can put something together fairly rapidly without having to spend an entire course or two actually just learning the software. Uh, there are a lot of different options out there now. There's there's Game Salad um, and many other different like web-based tools and so forth and so on. But actually, for tools, uh, you want to look at stuff that's really easy for them to get into an entry level. Um, as far as inspirational projects go, uh, basically, any um, really awesome games can, can be picked apart into inspiration, basically. Like, I know that uh, Portal actually became a part of a, a literature curriculum at one particular school because it has uh, a lot of interesting ideas about identity uh, embedded into it, like um, the uh, antagonist, of course, of Portal, uh, she has uh, her, her very strict and uh, orderly appearance she wants to project on the outside, but really you start getting in there and uh, 
you realize that things aren't all ship shape and the the whole place is actually kind of falling apart so it's it's one of those interesting uh, characterization type things and do we have game jams at my school do we think they're valuable um, I absolutely think game game jams are valuable. Now, my particular school doesn't get involved in game jams as of yet. I'm just adjuncting somewhere at the moment. Um, but there are always pockets of students at the school I attend for my graduate studies that are always uh, doing the game jam as well. I think the game jam is extremely valuable indeed because it, it forces them to get in there and just get a game out, make a game quick. And uh, we actually... Beyond just the global game jam, uh, our chapter of IGDA actually had their own game jam too. We just think that it's a, a very productive and effective um, thing to to engage in. Really, there's a lot of great games that have. I think uh, Spy Party was actually conceived as a game jam game, and then from there on, it was it was brought into something bigger. Uh, game jams can can really be the seeds to start something amazing because they force you to think outside the box. And can I comment on preparing youth at the high school level? What would I consider to be most important for educators working with high school students? Um, at least my own personal opinion on this matter is that we need to be to be frank with them and upfront that this this is a very competitive field. And I mean, my first step is basically to to dispel any uh, illusions, basically. Um, no, this isn't going to be all about just playing games and eating Fritos and drinking Mountain Dew and having action figures. There's, there's hard work. There's, there's deeper issues like crunch and uh, layoffs. And, you know, it, it, just defining the actual job against the idealized vision a lot of students have is, is highly important when, they, when they're first starting out. Now, um, another uh, thing that would be important at the high school level would be just getting them involved in the programs early on. Like uh, the ones who are interested in art, they need to start playing around with art programs like immediately, like Photoshop and, and uh, 3D modeling packages like 3D Studio Max and so forth. Any, anything you can get them playing with to prepare them. Uh, some high schools have more complex programs than others, so of course it also depends on the school. And it looks like a student that conveys that they will provide more value if they can if they consume will be more likely to be offered an internship. If a student has mastered a few to a few tools and techniques that are necessary to production, this will be valuable and ah, I see this is a comment on internships. Yeah. That's another thing that is true. Very, very good point here. Um, a lot of times internships also aren't publicly posted. Um, this is another one of those instances in which uh, networking, again, becomes highly important, as well as just being good at your craft. Uh, knowing people and talk to, talking to people can often lead to positions that aren't even posted. Very, very good point from Mark Hart. Uh, um, Paul likes uh, the observation to divorce people from their work, separating people personally from their work, um, and wonders if this should continue in a work-life balance. Um, absolutely, uh, you definitely have to have to be able to draw a line between your life and your work. Um, when the line starts to blur, people often become unwell, <laughs> and it's just not good for people and all. Um, that's that's why. The, the whole 80-hour, 100-hour work week thing just does not work. Uh, the, the line has vanished. People need to have some time to relax and, and not think about work. Absolutely, Paul. What are some resources? Uh, Matthew Tinga Santos wants to know, what are some resources that can dispel game dev mis misconceptions for students that don't have in-person access, uh, in access to development vets? Matthew, I'm glad you asked. Um, IGDA Chicago just actually posted a YouTube video of Ian Schreiber's uh, lecture called The Darker Side of the Game Industry just recently, um, in which Ian actually goes over a lot of different points. 
a lot of different points about the industry and misconceptions students have. And, and just basically, in contrast to a lot of the yay, breaking in talks, um, it's, he, he has a real, real discussion with a lot of excellent points regarding crunch and competition and so forth and so on. So um, in all, as a community, we're trying to get more resources out there to students as a whole. And it's, it's great that people like Ian are willing to give these types of lectures and, and willing to share them like this. OK, checking for more questions. How, how are we encouraging more women to take game development courses at the university? From Paul. Um, that one's really tricky, actually. Um, there's a lot of argument that we actually need to be preparing girls um, to be more open to the technical field at an earlier age. So some argue that at the university level, there's already too much of a, a barrier or um, a hurdle to overcome because they've already had a lot of misconceptions. Um, I personally just like to have a classroom environment that um, is welcoming, basically. I, I like everyone to be respectful of each other, and this is definitely something that, that helps students uh, feel that it's a little more approachable. Um, it, it's still a hurdle we're overcoming, the, the gender issue in, in both game development industry and in game education, but I, I think it's something we're gaining ground on. I think that is all of the questions. Unless, uh, do you see anything I missed, Luke? Uh, no, I think that's everything. Uh, unless somebody wants to bring, oh, oh. sorry, I haven't actually tied it up, have I? Uh, we did that one, we did that one, we did that one. Did we do this? Yeah, I think we, I think we, I think we got it. Okay. Hmm. Unless right. anyone else has any further questions. Chirp, chirp. All okay. right, you guys. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, well, I'll end the session since I'm chairing it. It's your yeah, turn sorry. to be a speaker. Uh, oh, we've got another question. We actually do have time. Uh, ah. So Matthew is asking... Uh, how would you go about bringing game dev education to schools that don't have it? Oh, that that is definitely a good question. Um, it's often really challenging because uh, things like budget and administration can kind of uh, also get in the way there. Uh, if a if a school can't afford or is unable to officially have a game development program, a nice alternative would be to form student clubs. Um, if you can uh, adopt a faculty member that would help facilitate that, that's very good. Otherwise, uh, students, in rare occasions, students can actually carry something like that on their own, too. But basically, uh, if you're unable to get a program, definitely try looking at clubs and interest groups to get students together and talking about games and collaborating. So Jessica asks, uh, ah. would you make similar recommendations for general IT teaching? For um, just in general what I covered today, um, well, absolutely. I mean, there's still a lot of uh, overlaps. Like, for instance, you're still looking at a lot of research and lifelong learning since it, just in technology in general, things are constantly changing. And uh, with, with how competitive job markets are right now, in just about any field, professionalism and networking and just overall courtesy and positive attitude are very valuable things to bring to the table. Uh, do I think that it's beneficial to go into local high schools and advertise the course, especially for girls who may have no idea what is involved, uh, trying to get them in earlier? Actually, absolutely. Um, we actually advertised uh, my course to high schools recently to try to generate more interest. And it definitely helps to get it out there and let them know that it's going on, because they, they can't obviously enroll if they don't know what's happening. So certainly working with the, the high schools is a good idea for um, undergrad programs. We should definitely be seeing more of that as well. Very good point, Beck.
Oh, there's another one. So Paul, again, is asking, yep. uh, what can professionals in the game industry do to help? Well, um, as we all know, the, a lot of uh, professionals are, are very busy people, and they're subject to crunch a lot of times, and it, it can be pretty challenging for them to help. But a lot of... Uh, a lot of them are very good about um, offering advice, uh, speaking to students, um, getting involved with their local IGDA chapters, and things like that. Uh, basically, any amount of advice um, professionals want to offer is great, as well as feedbacks on the educational programs. Um, if, if professionals have thoughts on what we can do to improve education, educators are certainly always open to hearing that. Ah, and one another question. <laughs> As uh, someone who really enjoys the prototyping aspects of game jams, what types of positions in the industry should I apply for? Um, if if you're big into prototyping and solving problems, um, a lot of times that aligns well with game design. However, um, unfortunately, game design is one of those really, really extra competitive types of positions. Um, a lot of times people transition to game design from another position in the company, such as uh, programming. Programming is a po popular one. Um, sometimes QA people you know, can make it up the ladder to game design. But um, because of the nature of the role of a game designer, basically controlling the overall output of uh, the project and what direction you know what what type of interactions it entails um it's it's always hard for people to like get into that position right off the bat and usually you'll need to uh need to actually put some things out there make some games and uh nowadays with there being uh, a lot of tools out there free free trials and uh and free student versions of programs uh, you can actually get your hands on some things and start building some things that you can show to employers at the very least. You can even uh, try, to, try to publish your own things if, if you're extra ambitious. Self-publishing is not completely out of, the, out of the question these days. <laughs>